So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today we are discussing carcinoma of unknown primary. The slides are moving. I'm on to the next slide. Is it moving? No, ma'am. And ah, no, it's not moving. No, even I'm. Okay, then maybe I'll just present it this way only. It's not moving in the slide mode. In the okay. now visible now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good yes, evening, it is, everyone. It is, it is. So. Yeah, today we are discussing carcinoma of uh, unknown primary. What is a carcinoma of unknown primary in head and neck? It is when a patient presents with a clinically manifest cervical lymphadenopathy and no primary tumor is identified through medical examination, history and diagnostic workup, which includes both invasive and non-invasive. Uh, various theories are proposed for the same. The primary could be of a small volume to overlook. It could be in the hidden location like the tonsillar crypt. So again, uh, we are not able to find it. It may have an extremely slow growth rate, so goes unnoticed. It may even in, uh, involute uh, because of the immunosurveillance, or it can be a branchial cleft origin or epithelial rest in the soft tissue of the neck. Uh, there is a significant reduction in the prevalence of carcinoma un, uh, unknown primary in uh, the recent era, and this is basically because of the modern functional imaging. So majority of them are identified. In the past, only about 1 to 7% of the patients presented with lymphadenopathy as a sole clinical presentation. In the West, because of the HPV-associated cancer, there appears to be an increased incidence of unknown primary. Now, in 1957, COMIS defined a criteria when to call it an unknown primary. So, there should be no history of previous malignancy. There should be no history of definite symptoms related to a primary tumor, no clinical or laboratory evidence of primary tumor, or one or more cervical masses proved histologically to be carcinoma. If all the four criteria are fulfilled, it is then we call it a unknown carcinoma of unknown primary. There is a change in the TNM staging for the unknown primary. So the T0 category has been eliminated from all, almost all uh, sites of the head and cancer except for nasopharynx, oropharynx, and salivary gland tumors because in this we have markers that can identify the probable site of origin. And in cases of salivary gland tumors, it can be picked up on the histology. So these sites retain T0 and for rest of the sites, it has been eliminated. Now, uh, another important thing to notice is that in the West, uh, uh, the uh, HPV associated oropharyngeal cancers are rising and 90% of the unknown primary there are associated with the uh, high risk HPV associated cancer. And a large majority of the nasopharyngeal cancer are positive for Epstein bar virus. And this can be detected by Epstein bar encoded RNA on it. So therefore, if we demonstrate the presence of EBV or HPV, the probable site of origin of the primary can be established. And that's why there is a recommendation to perform HPV-ish, P16 immunohistochemistry, and Iberish on all the cervical lymph nodes with carcinoma of unknown primary site. Now, how to uh, allot the end category to these patients? So there are three systems which we have to keep in mind. If it is EPV related a cervical lymphadenopathy, in that case, the end category of the nasopharynx is to be followed. If it is HPV related a cervical lymphadenopathy, which is P16 positive, in those cases, P16 oropharyngeal end category is to be followed. And if it is neither of the two, in those cases, we go by the routine end category of the head and neck cancer, which is the most common in our Indian scenario. We all are aware about the end category, which is routinely followed for head and neck cancer, which is based on the size of the node whether it is single or multiple, the laterality of the node. And recently in the 8th edition, uh, there has been incorporation of the extra nodal extension into this and this upstages the tumor directly to the N3B category. Uh, in the West, more applicable probably is the HPV associated cancer. And in that case, P16 associated uh, oropharyngeal cancer N category is followed. So N1 is any node which is ipsilateral and less than 6 centimeter. N2 is contralateral or bilateral neck node, again less than 6 cm, and N3 is any node which is more than 6 cm. Now the workup starts right from the clinical examination. So a meticulous history and symptoms uh, should be elicited. Uh, clinic, uh, the OPD examination should comprise of mapping of the neck node level. In addition, the oral cavity, oropharynx, nasopharynx should be examined. A 90 degree Hopkins examination should be performed to assess the larynx and hypopharynx, hoping to find the primary. Now, it's very, very important to meticulously identify the level of the neck node involved because that could give us a probable idea about the origin of primary. So, with the level 1 node, most probably is the oral cavity confined to the lower lip buccal mucosa or alveolus. If it is level 2 or upper, upper jugular node, which is metastatic, in those cases, we are looking out for the tongue and oropharyngeal primary. If it is mid jugular or lower jugular, in those cases, we are looking out for larynx, hypopharynx, and nasopharynx primary. And if level 5 is involved, then we are looking out for a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. 
scalp of aerotic tumor. A very important point here to understand is the concept of the workout node. So what is a workout node? It's a node that is present at the confluence of the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. And when this uh, node enlarges, it is a toroidal sign. And in those cases, we are probably dealing with the infraclavicular pathology where the probable site of origin could be a gastrointestinal malignancy, breast or testis. The investigation starts with clinching of the pathological diagnosis and the routine, uh, in, uh, routine suggested is a fine needle aspiration cytology because of the advantages associated with it. So it is efficient, minimally invasive, it is cheap. There's a minimal risk of seeding of the tract and it has a very high sensitivity of 97%, a specificity of 100%. It may have a high false positive rate, especially if it, we are dealing with a cystic metastasis. It should be performed under ultrasound guidance, preferably, and especially if we are dealing with the cystic neck nodes. And on-light adequacy of the samples should be performed to ensure that uh, the adequate sample has been collected from the representative tissue. Now, routine recommendations are to perform P16 and Ibirish. This can be performed on the cytology, but in case it's a limitation, in those cases, the ultrasound guided core biopsy should be performed where you get more tissue to perform the ISC for P16 and Ibirish. Uh, most of the time, it will clinch the diagnosis. We may end up in problem in two scenarios. It's a poorly differentiated carcinoma or the lymphoid aspirate. In case of the lymphoid aspirate, we need to repeat it. And if it's a poorly differentiated carcinoma, then one should go ahead and perform the immunohistochemistry uh, markers. The most common in hadnic tumor is squamous carcinoma lineage, and therefore the CK or EMA would be positive. In cases of differentiated thyroid carcinoma, it would express thyroglobulin, medullary carcinoma calcitonin, and if it's a melanoma, it will be S100 or HMB45. Uh, the open biopsy is not recommended in these cases for a couple of reasons, and it should be avoided. There may be a tumor spillage or seeking of the tract uh, where the uh, excision biopsy is performed. And in cases when we need to perform a completion a neck dissection, it may become, uh, it, the associated morbidity may increase because of the fibrosis and disruption of the facial plane. And also if the completion neck dissection is not performed, it's a very high risk for recurrence. So open biopsy is not recommended in these cases. The imaging modality of choice is a, a PET with a CT fusion, which is recommended in all the patients whenever available. And this should be performed before the manipulation of the tissue in the upper aerodigestive tract and before any biopsy is performed to avoid the false negative uh, rates. And the surgeon should focus on all the high-risk area depending upon which node is enlarged to identify the probable site of primary. Now, this is a meta-analysis uh, by Ristovan, which was published in 2004 that looked at the efficacy of PET in detection of the primary tumor and reported the sensitivity of 88 and specificity of 75%. And when the CT scan and the endoscopic findings were negative, PET could identify the primary tumors in about 24% of the cases, of which nearly 24% of the primaries were infraclavicular. It also detected additional advantage of PET over the local imaging. To detect is a distant metastasis, which was identified in 11.2% of the cases. PET has certain limitations. It is not very sensitive when it comes to the base of tongue because there's a physiological uptake by the lymphoid tissue in the base of tongue. But in cases of larynx and hypopharynx, it has a very high accuracy with a sensitivity and specificity of 100%. Here we can see a table which uh, is uh, summarizing various studies that have been done using the PET scan. And we can see that the detection rate with a PET scan can be as high as 50%. Now, uh, the second step would be to perform the pen endoscopy. That is the endoscopic examination of the larynx and nasopharynx. In cases of oral cavity and oropharynx, there could be a submucosal primary and the inspection should be supplemented with a palpation. And all this is performed, uh, it's, uh, it's performed in the anesthesia. And if there is any site of concern, a biopsy should be performed from that site. If it is a lower level neck node involvement, that is level four and level five, a focus should be hypopharynx and larynx to direct laryngoscopy. In addition, a esophagoscopy or bronchoscopy should be performed. So uh, biopsy in the past, uh, the blind biopsy was recommended in the past from nasopharynx, pariform sinus, hypopharynx, which is no more recommended now. It is based on the image guided. So wherever is the probable site of primary report from the PET scan or the imaging, that is from where we should perform the biopsy. Uh, this is more relevant in context to the Western world where the uh, unknown primary is more commonly associated with P16 positive cancer. And uh, this is a study that looked at the palatine tonsillectomy in the diagnostic workup of hedonic uh, squamous cell carcinoma of unknown primary origin, which comprised of 14 studies and in which 416 palatine tonsillectomies were performed. Uh, the authors reported that the tonsillar malignancy could be identified in 140 cases. So therefore, the detection rate was about 34%. And on the similar line, other recommendation is to perform a carpet resection, that is a bilateral tonsillectomy with superficial mucosa resection of the base of tongue. Now, in this study, authors uh, performed the procedure on 10 patients and could identify the primary nine patients. So detection rate of 90%. 
and it was in all cases it was smaller than a centimeter both these uh, procedures are more relevant in context to the western world where it is more commonly associated with p60 or hpv associated oropharyngeal cancer may not be very relevant in indian setting where the hpv associated oropharyngeal cancer is around 20 to 25% another thing that has been explored in this context is a narrow band imaging and uh, in this uh, authors have reported the detection rate of 34.5% uh, with a sensitivity of 91% and specificity of 95% when compared to the white light examination now this was the diagnostic workup of the unknown primary coming on to the management uh, again it can be divided into early stage and advanced stage with the early stage we have a single modality uh, treatment in majority of the cases surgery or radiotherapy when it is advanced stage cancer in there those cases we go ahead with a combined modality a treatment which is surgery followed by the adjuvant radiotherapy versus chemo radiotherapy now there is uh, no consensus there is no consensus which modality is better of the two surgery has its own advantage so it helps to accurately stage the nodal disease and uh, it is seen that in about 34 to 57% of the cases there may be upstaging of the nodal disease warranting a uh, adjuvant radiotherapy and in about 28% of the patients with n1 disease there may be extra nodal extension and in those cases actual chemo radiotherapy is warranted so this helps in the better prognostication and more more accurate or treatment planning uh, when the surgery is concerned whereas in radiotherapy the advantage is that in addition to the uh, the neck nodes that are involved it also radiates uh, the mucosa and therefore uh, probably eliminates the probable primary uh, if the surgery is being planned a few tips to keep in mind if there is a previous scar of the open biopsy dissection all the tissue should be excised meticulously uh, even if it is a single node without the ece in that case simple excision is not adequate and these patients should undergo a completion neck dissection or should be offered a definitive radiotherapy with a full dose otherwise the chances of recurrence are very very high in cases of radiotherapy again there is no consensus should it be selective or comprehensive selective is when it is confined only to the ipsi lateral neck irradiation it may or may not cover putative pharyngeal uh, mucosa and uh, in the definitive setting the radiation dose is 70 in adjuvant setting it is 60 comprehensive radiotherapy is that covers bilateral neck and uh, all the probable uh, primary sites for mucosa it is associated with high uh, treatment morbidity imrt has been recommended uh, to get the benefit and limit the morbidity however there is no clear cut benefit of one type over another so various studies have shown that there is a decreased emergence of a primary using the comprehensive radiotherapy and also the better loco regional control but there is no obvious uh, disease free survival or overall survival benefit so there is no clear cut recommendation which to be followed uh, however the selective or the unilateral is more commonly being followed now and what are the indications when we need to cover both the necks so if we have a manifest we have manifest nodes on both the sides in those cases bilateral radiation should be contemplated if it is extensive nodal disease on the ipsilateral side which puts the contralateral neck at a high risk high risk of occult nodal metastasis in those cases bilateral radiotherapy should be contemplated or in the cases where we are suspecting the primary to be in the midline or close to the midline like if it is a base of thumb as previously associated or it is a nasal pharynx which is ebv associated in those cases bilateral neck should be irradiated the surveillance post uh, treatment surveillance is the routine for these patients which is every 1 to 3 months in the first year 2 to 6 months in the second year and 4 to 8 months in the third year uh, a post treatment scan in if a non surgical modality has been followed is recommended within the period of 3 months and most commonly that is a pet scan So, if the PET scan, which is performed at the ten to twelve week, is negative, in those cases the patients can be observed. If the PET scan is equivocal, in those cases a repeat PET scan should be performed three to six months after the baseline imaging. And if there is a gross residual disease, in those cases the biopsy and the local imaging should be performed to uh, stage the residual disease and to offer the patient surgery if it is feasible. In situation where there is inadequate response uh, in the neck from the non-surgical approach. Uh, the pet scan is very very handy because it has a very high negative predictive value and that's why the imaging modality of choice in the setting so uh, to summarize these patients present with a neck mass and uh, the initial uh, clinical examination should be uh, meticulous uh, not only for the neck node level but also for the oral cavity oropharynx nasopharynx and hypopharynx which should be performed as a opd procedure these uh, fnac should be performed to clinch the pathological diagnosis this patient should undergo a pet scan which has the uh, advantage of finding the primary and the distant metastasis uh, in cases we are dealing with a poorly differentiated cancer isp should be performed and for all the squamous carcinoma lineage a p16 or ebri should be performed to identify the probable site of origin if uh, no site of origin is found and it is uh, upper level neck node involvement in those cases examination under anesthesia palpation should be performed 
wherever there is a high risk area a biopsy under the image guidance should be performed in the western world tonsillectomy and lingual tonsillectomy with a mucosa resection of the base of tongue is recommended and if it is a lower level nectode in those cases the area to focus are larynx hypopharynx along with esophagus and the bronco, uh, bron bronchoscope so coming to the treatment so if it's a squamous uh, carcinoma lineage in those cases if it's an n1 disease the treatment would like to offer a neck resection or radiotherapy if it is advanced n2 n3 disease in those cases again a neck resection can be performed followed by adjuvant of uh, radiotherapy or chemo radiotherapy depending upon the histology or a concurrent chemo radiotherapy in these patients thank you uh, thank you ma'am thank you for the, uh, the presentation and very comprehensively uh, touching on all the points including management and workup now we'll move on to the case presentation part for case presentation i would like to invite dr jitendra kumar sharma from tata memorial hospital mumbai uh, as the presenter for case and uh, for the discussion as uh, faculty i would like to invite dr sudhir nayar sir from uh, tmh uh, actrec uh, tmh mumbai dr arvind krishna murthy sir uh, professor surgical oncology cancer institute uh, adiyar chennai uh, now i would also like to invite dr kanti kumar gangethi consultant uh, uh, from indo american cancer hospital and research institute telangana and uh, uh, dr richa vash uh, from uh, associate professor tata memorial hospital mumbai dr. I think we can start now with the permission of all the faculties over here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I will start with my case presentation, sir. Is it my, sure. is my screen sure. visible, sir? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, my case is a 20-year-old lady from Navi, uh, Mumbai, Maharashtra, housewife and belongs to the lower social economic status and presented with the complaint of swelling in the right side of neck since last 6 months uh, patient was apparently asymptomatic 6 month back when she noticed swelling in the right side of the neck which was insidious in onset and small in size around the size of lemon initially and after she noticed the swelling the swelling rapidly progresses in size to attain the present size of around an orange and it is not it was not associated with any pain and uh, no history of any discharge from the swelling was there patient doesn't have any complaint of uh, any ulcer in the oral cavity or swelling in the oral cavity patient doesn't have doesn't have any uh, complaint of difficulty in breathing or swallowing patient doesn't have the uh, uh, complaint of any foreign body sensation throat repeated throat uh, throat clearing no complaint of uh, any throat pain no complaint of any blood stained sputum no complaint of nasal blockage or nasal discharge no complaint of cough uh, cough no complaint of pain in the ear and the patient doesn't have any history of significant weight loss patient also doesn't have any history of fever no history of abdominal symptoms are there no history of cough evening rise in temperature night sweats and no history of contact with patient with tuberculosis is there patient is a non smoker and non alcoholic Uh, coming to the past history, patient uh, doesn't have any sim uh, similar complaint in past. Is she is uh, doesn't have any history of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, asthma, tuberculosis. She doesn't have any history of uh, any surgery in the past. Patient is not having any history of radiation exposure in the past. Coming to the personal history, patient is uh, is having no history of tobacco, pan or beedi. Uh, and machinery use uh, in past uh, patient is having normal bowel and bladder habit normal sleep and appetite with uh, mixed uh, taking mixed diet she is a married uh, woman with one child that is a female child aged 2 years and uh, patient is having normal menstrual history and patient doesn't have any significant family history of similar kind of illness in the family uh, should i continue sir yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, Uh, by summarizing my uh, stream uh, of the patient is a 20 year old lady uh, resident of navi mumbai housewife non smoker non alcoholic uh, 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 and uh, no use of uh, any form of tobacco presented with complaint of swelling in the right side of neck since last 6 months that is rapidly progressive in size coming to the examination uh, general exam coming to general examination patient's uh, general condition is uh, fair and uh, patient is febrile with ecog status of 0 uh, patient is comfortable at rest and averagely built and nourished uh, patient's bp is 180 by 74 recorded in left arm and sitting posture pulse rate 84 per minute respiratory rate 20 per minute patient doesn't have any pelor ecterus cyanosis clubbing generalized lymphadenopathy or pedal edema uh, coming to the examination of the neck 
patient is on inspection patient is uh, having a approximately 5 into 6 cm size single rounded well delineated swelling present to the right side of the neck corresponds to the level 2 and 3 it is not moving with deglutition not moving with protrusion of the tongue skin over the swelling looks abnormal and thinned out and discolored uh, there is no pulsation over the swelling is uh, seen no discharge from the swelling and no other uh, swelling is seen in the ipsilateral neck or contralateral neck uh, on palpation uh, finding of uh, inspection was confirmed and patient have a 5.5 into 6 cm size single swelling in the right side level 2 and 3 area this is not moving with deglutition it extends from around le uh, level of hyoid superiorly to the two finger above the uh, level of clavicle and medially it is reaching till midline and laterally is involving the sternocleidomastoid muscle the skin over the swelling is not pinchable with thinning out and impending fungation at one point and swelling is hard in consistency and fixed to surrounding structures temperature over the swelling is normal surface of the of the swelling is smooth and no oscillations are seen uh, felt on the swelling no palpable brit uh, brut is there on the swelling no other uh, swelling the same side of neck or contralateral neck is there from the oral examination of the uh, oral cavity uh, patient has the adequate mouth opening with no restriction of protrusion of tongue patient has a fair oral hygiene lips gums tongues and bilateral rmt floor of mouth are normal and the patient has is not having any tobacco stain in the oral mucosa uh, oropharynx bilateral tonsillar pillar tonsillar fossa soft palate posterior pharyngeal wall uh, looks normal no abnormal growth or swelling is seen in the oropharynx also and on palpation in the uh, oropharynx base of tongue looks supple and uh, bilateral tonsil looks supple uh, coming to the examination of the scalp and head and neck skin area the uh, on examination the, the uh, scalp and head and neck skin area is not showing any abnormal lesion or pigmentation uh, hop, coming to the hopkins examination uh, uh, base of tongue bilateral epiglottis uh, looks normal bilateral arytenoids arabiglot uh, folds look normal bilateral false cords bilateral two cords Uh, looks normal and mobile chink is adequate and bilateral pfs and postrigoid area looks normal on office exam Di on uh, doing a direct nasoloscopy uh, uh, bilateral nasal cavity and uh, middle meatus uh, looks normal no growth or abnormal because i seen uh, on direct nasoloscopy examination nasopharynx uh, is looks normal no growth or abnormal because i seen in the nasopharynx this is the clinical picture of the patient this is the front look and lateral uh, is showing a Uh, single well defined swelling with the uh, abnormal skin uh, in uh, with the impending fungation at uh, one point coming to the systemic examination uh, uh, cardiovascular system uh, examination is normal with normal uh, heart sounds and no murmur is seen respiratory uh, sounds bilateral vesicular breathing sounds are heard and no added sounds are there abdomen is soft and uh, cns examination is normal um, uh, for going for a diagnosis na um, what all other have you uh, palpated the thyroid and other things yes sir uh, on neck uh, the examination of the neck uh, uh, no uh, no other swelling is uh, uh, palpable uh, other than uh, the uh, the well delineated swelling the right side of the neck thyroid looks normal on palpation you should have mentioned What? specifically in that uh, in your physical examination findings i think i have not seen or have you um, i don't know whether i missed it but i think i have not seen that examination of thyroid because sometimes thyroid swelling is also metastasized in the neck yeah and that can be a problem the thyroid may be non palpable also <coughs> in this uh, may not be visible also but it can have a my small disease uh, uh, yeah so uh, so what is a what is your professional diagnosis only one node is present or multiple nodes there the single node or single well delineated node, uh, node present sir is it node a matted conglomerated mass of node or a single um, what is the uh, uh, surface uh, of the surface of the node uh, is uh, smooth uh, so uh, by palpation uh, of the smooth swelling uh, feels like a single node jitendra one question i wanted to ask you said very categorically that it's a lateral neck swelling when you mentioned level 2 and level 3 but you also mentioned a point that it does not move with deglutition or protrusion of the tongue now uh, could you just tell me which lateral swelling were you expecting to move with the deglutition or protrusion of the tongue when it is level 2 and 3 right lateral neck that you were talking ma'am uh, sw uh, swelling uh, uh, that is related to uh, uh, thyroid thyroid swelling uh, uh, will move with the uh, deglutition of uh, uh, deglutition and uh, deglutition and uh, uh, protrusion of tongue will not be significant in the lateral swelling because of the 
thyroglossal cyst uh, which move with the protrusion of the tongue that is the midline swelling the thyroid swelling can present as a lateral swelling uh, when it is uh, arising from the uh, uh, superior pole or uh, lateral part of the uh, thyroid lobe uh, jitendra uh, dr arvind can, can i ask you something <coughs> Uh, you had uh, said the stage was T zero and three B M zero. So what is T zero at this point of time? Like, no? uh, sir, uh, actually T zero is uh, at this point of the time there is uh, no uh, role of T. Uh, I cannot I cannot say that it's a T zero before doing a pan endoscopy or PET CT and or uh, doing a ISC uh, or identifying a P uh, sixteen or EBV status. This is not a Uh, on clinically, uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, primary is identified uh, on the clinical examination. That's why I have no tell that it is easy. On NM, no signs of sign symptoms of any distal metastasis and no uh, uh, sign symptoms and uh, clinically identified primary is there. And also, if N three B, can you comment at this point of time? Sir, uh, skin involvement is there because of sir. extra nodal you are telling. Yes, sir. If the same thing was supposed to be say. P sixteen positive, then it's no. No, sir. It will be N three, not B. Because it is uh, six less than six, or uh, what is your size? Is you said less than size six? Size is right? six point uh, five into six uh, six centimeter. So it will become N one, right? If it's only one no, one side node, if it is said. So you don't know, right? At this point of time, uh, what is the yes, stage? Sir. Yes. Sir. Because um, uh, only basis of skin involvement, I have written N three. Right. Right. And uh, what is the like? You know. Uh, Okay. Anyway, as we so go, I ahead, think we I I I can ask because if primary non-detected and primary not there is slightly different. Different. It is so. What if primary is ane uh, non-detected T zero may uh, is it T zero or uh, something else? T X we can say sir. X. Yes. Because you uh, know the differentiation you have to make. Yes. Sir. We don't know where exactly the primary. And yes. we say there is no primary. There are both uh, have different. Yes, no, no, both are different. Because uh, T zero connotation, I think, in uh, uh, Carlstrom of unknown primary would possibly be in which settings, Doctor Jitin? Sir, so T zero uh, will we will say uh, as uh, in the uh, talk we uh, talk, ma'am has discussed that T zero will be uh, said in the cases of P uh, sixteen uh, positive uh, cases, uh, Carlstrom of oropharynx. Carcinoma, um, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. That will be uh, if, if there is a EBV ER right. positive, right. or any salivary gland tumor. That is, uh, um, we can diagnose on histopathology. Then we can yeah. see see say the T zero. Yeah, salivary becomes a known primary. Yes. In an unknown primary, it will be either a HPV six. HPV positive or E six or an EBV positive. EBV positive. positive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, because you put this combination of no. T zero or N three B, like yes, no? yes. So that is why I sort of you know at at this point of time we don't There's know. No, right? yes. yeah. yeah, I think we That's should right. not uh, clearly do yes. that at this point of time. Yes. Um. Af after further evaluation and probably then we can ascertain whether there is whether it is viral related or is uh, something else or okay from where it is originating. All those things are a lot of information we need. <clears throat> Yes. We don't know even it is malignancy or not. Though clinically it looks like that, you know. It's a suspicious. Uh, yeah. Suppose it is a conglomerate mass coming like that. What else will be another? Another yeah, twenty-one-year-old lady with uh, this much lymph node, six months evolution. Twenty-one-year-old female with the conglomerated uh, uh, lymph nodes uh, or conglomerated mass. Uh, it can be a lymphoma. It can be a tuberculosis also. You can keep. All these things are differential, but I guess no. Some of the clinchers are you are telling uh, uh, like fungation, skin yes. involvement, hard. So no, so all these things you know uh, possibly would put malignancy as a first. But I guess uh, in the Indian setting, you must keep a couple of differentials also uh, as as you what what you have mentioned. So how will you proceed? So uh, for uh, workup, sir, uh, first first after the uh, clinical thorough clinical examination and. Uh, Uh, all the office procedures like Hopkins examination, direct nasal endoscopic examination. First, uh, uh, we'll uh, go ahead ahead with the any imaging. So imaging in uh, either we can uh, first as a, as per the NCCN guideline. Uh, first imaging we can go ahead with the CT scan or MRI, and uh, then we can uh, go ahead with the FNEC. FNEC uh, uh, we uh, we can do a direct FNEC. 
or a core biopsy also and then can be added with the uh, usg guided core uh, usg guidance in the, uh, cases if needed according to the uh, imaging uh, if it is a necrotic material necrotic uh, central necrosis having central necrosis you can add the usg guidance in the, our case we have done a usg guided core biopsy with, uh, with testing of p16 and ebv on the uh, core biopsy sample and after that we can go ahead with the pet scan uh, and uh, what was the report? Uh, FNAC uh, showed uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma with the P16 positives, EBV negative and P16 positive. Okay, Jitendra, I just so you do one this? question that. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So, uh, Jitendra, you said you will do a CT or the MRI, then you will do the FNAC, uh, and then you are going to do the PET scan. Uh, what additional information are you go get, are going to get with the baseline CT MRI that you will not get with the PET scan? That you want to do all the imaging models, use all the imaging modalities for the investigation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 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 even though that we are going to do a PET scan, uh, NCCN uh, or ESCO guideline has recommended the. The, uh, the use of CCT or MRI is the first investigation because in a few cases uh, we can avoid uh, we can detect a, the, the primary site on CT scan or MRI. Uh, the sensitivity of uh, uh, CT MRI CT scan on detecting primary is around uh, uh, around fifty percent for for to fifty percent in uh, we can detect a, a primary. So, so I, I, can, I can I can I can. Yeah, let me add, you know, in our setting, so we, uh, in a Western world, the cost of PET scan is uh, significant. Our side also it is costly. But in a hospital, you know, we give subsidized, you know, government public hospitals, they will subsidize. Now, we have said CT scan, we have MRI scan, we have PET scan, PET, C, PET CCT. You know, the thing is, we really can, how will you choose? Because sometimes, CCT, I agree. It will be sensitive. It is cost effective. Sensitive, it detects the primary, it's fine enough. Yes. But, um, you know, again, you may have to do PET CT sometimes to rule out distant metastasis. Yes, or, uh, you need know, MRI scan if you are uh, considering more anatomical delineation and yes. getting more information. Um, suppose you want to choose. Because, you know, time is an also an important this, part. Each scan, uh, there will be a waiting list. In this uh, case scenario, I'll go ahead with the PET scan direct because it will uh, give us uh, better sensitivity than the CT MRI. It will give us uh, uh, added benefit of uh, detecting distant metastasis and uh, sensitivity is better and it's added benefit of detecting distant metastasis primary. And it will reduce the time, wait times time. because, you know, for set CT for, scan, there will be a wait list. MRI scan, there is another wait list and yes. then the patient go for this thing, there is yes. another wait list. Yes. It's better to skip all those things because uh, it's customized for our, our site of, uh, you know, settings. Uh, I just ask one more question. Could you, could you tell me the limitations of PET scan? In this? Limitations of a PET scan. Yeah, limitations of PET scan. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. PET scan is uh, the uh, having very good sensitivity, but the specificity of the PET scan is the... Uh, uh, very good sensitive and specificity, but the uh, PET scan is uh, positive predictive value is less and it, it can have uh, even up to some series uh, retrospective study shows that it can have to, uh, even up to 20 percent uh, of the cases it can be false positive results can be there in the PET scan especially in the area of uh, wall air rings uh, and uh, salivary glands uh, that there will be a, um, a physiological uptake uh, so it can uh, give us a, a, a false uh, uh, positive results. So the anatomical uh, delineation you are getting in a PET CT is also limited. limited. Suppose you are considering surgery or other things, you know. And uh, but we, we we nowadays we do PET CCT, so we get yes. contrast and scans. Contrast so we may have and it is costly. And third, um, you can have false positive results. Especially infective uh, for say it can show it as light up in a PET scan. So these are some of the things. But anyway, we will always uh, substitute. Also, we will complement it with uh, biopsies or a fine needle biopsy so that right. you know, um, histopathological diagnosis can be assessed. Yeah. And, and nowadays also you have PET MRI is also as there. So I guess you know that can also sort of you know um, give. Yeah, facilities available. You can look 
Yeah, but most of the NCCN guidelines, na, they sort of, you know, they see for, I also saw this, na, they advise CT initially because uh, that, no, of a chance of picking up. In fact, what they say is that you also should do P16 first if it is negative only to do EBV. Again, so, yeah, so all these things are, are possibly aimed at, you know, rationalizing resources and it applies more to the West. But in cases of, you know, our setup, no, uh, so you should be sort of, you know, when examiners are sort of inclined to sort of quiz you from the practicality aspect, logistic aspect, no? so you should sort of, you know, know that aspect of it. But at the same time, you should have some uh, idea about what is the evidence to do one followed by the other. You know? so that's the way you have to sort of, you know, rationalize whatever you've said in, in, in our exam. Uh, after doing a PET scan and uh, uh, FN uh, coronal biopsy, guided coronal biopsy, we get a, a diagnosis uh, of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma with the P16 positive status. And we, can, we, we will also do a uh, examination under anesthesia. In uh, the PET scan of this patient was uh, showing at FDG with central necrotic mass was, that was extending from right cervical level two to four. And it was sized of 8.5 into 6.5 into 5 centimeter uh, on PET CT. And it was closely abutting the external carotid artery, internal carotid artery, and common carotid artery. And with angle of abutment was less than 180 degree. And uh, IGV was not seen, that is completely encased by the tumor. And it was closely abutting the right lobe of the thyroid uh, gland with the lo loss of the fat planes. And the rest of the scan shows uh, uh, normal physiological update. No primary site identified on the PET scan. And uh, uh, pan endoscopy that done in that was uh, done in the, under general anesthesia. Uh, we have done a uh, fiber optic laryngoscopic examination uh, that shows uh, in that uh, visualized part of the nasopharynx and laryngopharynx appears normal. And uh, direct laryngoscopy also we have done uh, to see uh, the hidden areas like post recoid area and uh, retroid area. So that also shows uh, no uh, primary site. EUA, we have done in the bilateral tonsil and uh, base, base of tongue and tonsil looks supple. And uh, upper GI on endoscopy also done. That is not uh, showing any uh, primary, any uh, abnormal lesion in the upper uh, gastrointestinal tract. So Jitendra, what are the hidden sites where you wanted to do the direct laryngoscopy? So specifically, uh, which sites you wanted uh, to look adding into? To the, adding to the sir, uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy, uh, the only, few only sites that uh, can be hidden is the uh, areas of the post recoid or uh, post recoid uh, area that uh, we will not be able to see see without lifting uh, uh, the uh, larynx on direct laryngoscopic examination. So, the, <clears throat> what about the pyriform sinus well, FX? Yes, sir. Pyriform sinus FX. So, basically, pyriform you have to insufflate. Yes, sir. Pyriform sinus FX, sometimes we will not be able to see on FL also. So these are the certain hidden areas where you wanted yes, to sir. specifically see on a direct laryngoscopic right. examination. Yes. Now let's make sure that you need to palpate the uh, base of tongue whenever it is possible for you in an examination or anesthesia. So if I might, so in ask, the case, how do you, how do you assess the these areas, the apex of the piriform and post cricoid? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you for, how do you assess them if they, they are blind in a direct laryngoscopy? In a direct laryngoscopy, sir, we, we can assess these areas by lifting the uh, when we lift, uh, do the direct laryngoscopy, we can lift the larynx and we can see in the post cricoid area uh, uh, when uh, we are doing a direct laryngoscope using a hyperpharyngoscope. That, that is one way. The other way is when you are doing a formal upper endoscopy, yeah? oh, the flexible endoscopy. Yes, sir. So you can, you not, at that time you insufflate, right? So whenever you are insufflating, Supplation test. Supplation test. So, no, not insufflate, but whenever no. you are doing an uh, endoscopy for the, to visualize the esophagus and stomach, when you are pulling it out, then at that time you would be able to see this ru uh, mucosa, ru uh, rugal uh, mucosa wave pattern. So at that time you can be very much sure. In direct, sometimes it's difficult, of, although theoretically you can lift but not in all cases you may be able to get that uh, visualization yes. part. Yeah, Sudhir, you're uh, saying something. No, no, I, I was wondering, you know, it is a P16 positive case, so do we yep, need yep, any yep, extra correct. evaluation? Yeah, <laughs> I agree, I agree. Do you need any extra evaluation? Uh, sir, uh, P16 uh, positive status, uh, we can go ahead with the uh, uh, tonsillectomy, cilatal palatine tonsillectomy. Uh, and follow, if uh, it's negative and followed, then, then we can uh, go for a uh, 
epsilateral uh, lingual tonsil like could diagnose the primary yeah so i think i feel that you know she is a young lady uh, with the p16 positive possibly one of the reason site what could be the possible sites if you are tracing possible uh, sites uh, of uh, primary is most probable site is oropharynx that can be in the tonsil epsilateral palatine tonsil or uh, epsilateral lingual uh, tonsil or base of tongue area and uh, other than that uh, uh, base of tongue uh, palatal base of tongue can be there and um, uh, according to the literature from the west around 80 to 90% of the cases of uh, p16 positive primary will be in the uh, oropharynx only but it can arise from the larynx or hypopharynx also in some cases which uh, site tonsil or base of tongue and tonsil is the most common site an indian indian data what is the indian data showing which is you know overall hp 16 positive cases are less in india india you know right? but yes. in among that you see the pattern which have tonsil or Uh, sir, I don't know the tonsillar region have a higher, uh, I think, uh, yeah. So they have higher chance of P16 positivity. Overall, it is around 30 to 40 percent Indian data, whereas Western data is almost 80 percent. Some shows 90 percent. We we don't have that much positive because we have predominantly um, tobacco related uh, head and neck cancers. even if p16 positive also they are have a tobacco related rates okay because they are also used tobacco in this patient do not have any tobacco related habit, no tobacco habits okay so anything you can tell about uh, hpv and tobacco any recent uh, data that has come that uh, you can have uh, h to use of tobacco and hpv is uh, first thing is that that uh, hp in uh, hpv positive cancers uh, the the is like uh, predominantly the, the it will not be uh, patient will not be a uh, tobacco user or smoker and if a, a patient hpv positive high risk hpv positive patients say having a uh, smoker also there are these uh, patients tends to do good not uh, as uh, tends to do better than the uh, counterpart of hpv negative uh, smoker uh, patient that's the uh, but there is some there is some recent data which is presented at the asco this year of the subgroup analysis of the ecog acrin trial you are aware of that uh, check that out i think uh, what you said is the traditional thing like no we always believe that hpv positive does best this was the intermediate group and the negative was the worst but then some data to suggest of course that was a subgroup analysis of the ecog acrin which was presented in asco uh, 2022 a couple of months back that saying that the prognosis is no different but uh, of course this is an evolving data uh, i'm sure the pendulum will keep swinging one way or the other but i think these are thoughts that you must keep it it is two questions to you one is that you said that hpv associated better prognosis first question is why and the second question is are you aware of any grouping i mean all hcv positive all cancer cancer behave the same uh, it takes you to ecog uh, ecog 33 level of course so what kind of a segregation do we follow there any reason reason for the hpv uh, associated uh, tumors uh, tends to do uh, well is the uh, the first thing is that uh, these tumors are uh, Uh, more uh, radio sensitive and uh, more sensitive to radiation and ke- chemotherapy and uh, the uh, they have uh, the uh, in mo- in their uh, molecular uh, pathway the, the patient will have uh, the uh, wild type uh, patient have the uh, suppression of the uh, rb uh, protein is there in the uh, this uh, hpv related tumors that so, uh, what is what is uh, what is p p53 basically you are asking what is a p53 what is what type of gene it is p53 is a tumor suppressor gene sir yeah. and what is the difference of this p53 in a hpv related cancer and non hpv related in a tobacco cancers what happens you told that wild type p, what, is wild type p53, what is wild type p53 what is wild type p53 in tobacco related cancer what happens the p53 will be mutated 
then mutated p53 will not be able to suppress and the tumor suppression will be uh, effect of the tumor suppression will not be there and uh, it, that the patient will tend to uh, do bad uh, in, this patient will tend to do bad but in uh, the sp positive patient when there is wild type of p53 there there is a normal uh, phenotype is uh, there uh, in these kind of patient uh, uh, these patient will tend to do better than the uh, In, in survival advantage with the radiotherapy. <laughs> so some uh, I don't remember exactly, sir. This is a uh, in. Uh, so what are the typical uh, clinical uh, clinical feature of a HPV related cancer? Do you think this particular patient fits into the typical clinical feature of a HPV related cancer? Yes, sir. Uh, Your patient uh, is a young patient with large lymph node, you know, fungi yes, type of. Yes, sir. Do you think it this will fit into HPV related, or it is a more aggressive tobacco related cancer? What do you think? HPV related, HPV related, it fits into the HPV related uh, related tumor, sir. In uh, HPV related tumor, will be a uh, patient will be a young patient with the uh, young patient and uh, with the. They are not young patient. They can be younger age yes, group. Yeah. Will be younger. younger age group patient no, with that. the, the non smoker, non alcoholic. and with the large cystic node uh, patient will having a large and cystic node and and uh, but large cystic uh, node everything uh, everything fits in here but in your yeah. case this node is not cystic you know this is a fundating as this is a yeah it's a lot fundating. of fun. so, so i think this is slightly bizarre so uh, uh, your uh, all other features are fitting but you know somewhere in india now you get all these bizarre sort of uh, things so that you must keep in mind Yeah, but you're right. I think most of what you said is right. You then suppose if you have a contralateral node, even in this patient, apart from the ipsilateral, then how do you want it to approach regarding the tonsil or base tank? Sir, uh, if a patient is uh, having a uh, contralateral node also, uh, the approach will be uh, the line of approach will be same in this patient. We'll go ahead with the uh, ipsilateral palatine tonsillectomy. Uh, Uh, because the uh, first we have to do on the great uh, larger uh, burden side of the disease, but we have to do ipsilateral uh, on that side. We have to do uh, ipsilateral. If patient have bilateral uh, uh, lymph nodes, we have go ahead with the uh, ipsil uh, uh, lingual tonsillectomy on the mm. same side. Same then side. Then we have go. It's not bilateral uh, tonsillectomy. Yeah, ipsilateral lingual tonsillectomy on the same side. Then we go. Uh, if it's negative, we can go for the contralateral lingual tonsillectomy. If it it is also negative, then we go for the ipsilateral palatine tonsil. Oh, but in this case, you know, so it's a slightly different sort of a presentation. So it's almost uh, even an N three, you know, almost by virtue of the size, at least in a PET CT, you know. So would you still be inclined to sort of you know such a large volume nodal eight centimeters and it's fixed? Would you still be wanting to do this exercise? No, no, sir, no, sir. We'll not uh, because they will not going to. Uh, Uh, do a the surgical intervention is this patient the patient will not go ahead with the uh, lingual tonsillectomy or palatine tonsillectomy we have a p16 status here so we know that uh, we can uh, predict that uh, primary would be uh, can be in the oropharynx somewhere and uh, even though it will not make any difference in our uh, treatment part is a large bulky node on one side and that is n3 We have to do a bilateral neck radiation in this patient, uh, right. so we'll go ahead with the de definitive CT RT directly. Sir. There's no point of doing a knee ipsilateral palatine tonsillectomy. So, what is your uh, next step? In the so you did evaluation, and what is your next step? Uh, sir, uh, my evaluation is done with the, all those things. We have not uh, done the uh, tonsillectomy, palatine tonsillectomy in this patient, and we had uh, decided to go ahead uh, with the. Uh, our uh, final uh, my final diagnosis is uh, is squamous carcinoma of unknown primary uh, on the right side of the neck with skin involvement and p16 positive so stage it will staged as t c t3 t0 n3 m0 and stage is uh, uh, stage 3 and uh, my management plan will be to i will uh, go ahead with the definitive ctrt in this case the cisplatin based chemotherapy uh, concurrent cisplatin uh, will uh, give in this patient sir on 100 mg per meter square on 120 to 140 days uh, so giving the you are uh, calling it a hpv associated oropharyngeal cancer and you also mentioned that they have a better prognosis 
so uh, there is a concept of deintensification of treatment in the in these cancers so uh, can you tell me what is the current status with all the trials that have been published i mean is there any trial positive to support the role of deintensification that you will suggest or we go by convention uh, ma'am uh, there are a few trials that has been published and uh, they have suggested uh, the uh, in uh, the hpv positive uh, uh, oropharyngeal cancers they suggested uh, even up to the two year disease free survival of up to, up to 95% they have shown uh, with the uh, dose of 60 gray instead of 70 gray uh, uh, they have shown uh, uh, disease free survival of 95% but uh, still now there is uh, no recommendation uh, uh, to use the de escalation uh, uh, protocol in the uh, outside of the clinical trial settings because these trials are i think phase 2 trial what i have uh, read uh jitendra there is one question from the comment box that you know can we give concurrent rt because rt people will may say that it's forgetting it may behave badly on radiotherapy can we what's it can we do give uh, concurrent rt do you think in a forgetting node it is a a forgetting not it is not forgetting it is not forgetting about to forget about to forget any other option or uh, sir uh, we can give a uh, uh, nct if we radiation oncologist feels that uh, rt will not be feasible for this patient we can uh, uh, give uh, nct in uh, this case uh, and uh, after the response assessment and if the uh, we can go ahead with the uh, ctr and as it is a p16 positive it may will will have a better uh, response yeah there are options from what i understand and sometimes you can give uh, chemo radiation definitive also in this particular patient also because considering that you may have but i guess you no know, you that going the induction way is also a reasonable option if uh, some of the radiation oncologists have concerns but i think some of them i know give definitive chemo radiation in this sort of set so there is a, suppose uh, it is not p16 positive Will you change your approach, or you go ahead stick with the same? If it is uh, not P sixteen positive, and uh, uh, if it is uh, even if it is not P sixteen positive, we will not change my approach. Basically, basically according to the ESCO guideline, uh, N three uh, nodes we should uh, do a CTRT, bilateral uh, neck uh, to the bilateral necks and uh, put at a primary sites. Uh, we should go at uh, ctrt in a uh, large volume nodes so it will uh, not change my uh, treatment option i will not uh, go ahead with the ctrt if uh, required not respond then we will we can uh, later on we can uh, follow up with the pet scan and uh, we can go to the salvage and this so if you want to give a comprehensive rt to both the sides that what are the problems that you are expecting to happen for this patient uh, uh, if you are giving the uh, uh, radiation to bilateral neck there will yes. be uh, uh, our radiation related toxicities will be higher when we are addressing the bilateral neck patient will be having high uh, after a radiation patient will be having um, uh, hypothyroidism uh, patient can have hypothyroidism and we, we can we have to start with the uh, on the thyroxin no 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 it. specifically quality of life not about hypothyroidism yes. what sort of quality yes. of life because you are uh, bilaterally radiation comprehensive rt you are talking about comprehensive rt on both the sides so something like dark structures can you tell us something about dark structures what are the dark structures dysphagia aspiration related structures actually this uh, terminology i have not read sir but uh, yes definitely patient will have a, a more uh, toxicity than he will having dysphagia and uh, Uh, more the uh, swallowing difficulty and dysphagia definitely he will have so he will so have. you need to talk to your radiation oncologist specifically regarding the techniques and you have to look into this like uh, what are the IMRT, last practices yeah? should do a imrt uh, with the use imrt or cdcrt should be used for the kind of thing. even the nowadays all everyone is using IMRT. so all the three superior medial and inferior constrictors along with a base of tongue vocal cord and your pico pharynx with an upper esophageal sphincter these are all the constituents of your dar structures so if you try to irradiate bilaterally with a comprehensive rt definitely patient will have a difficulty in swallowing yes so you will uh, lifelong the most of the times patient will go on to a tube dependency jitendra you mentioned about hypothyroidism is it a early toxicity 
and intermediate toxicity or no, late toxicity? No, not early toxicity. It's a uh, part of late toxicity, not early. Sir, sir, late toxicity. So you told us something you wanted to follow with the pets, pet surveillance. Yes. yes, sir. So could you quote the reference regarding that? What is the pet uh, uh, study? Uh, Regarding the pet pet surveillance after post CTRT, the, the randomized phase three control trial in phase three in the non uh, randomized control trial of the uh, non inferiority trial of the Mahana et al. that was published in two thousand seventeen, and uh, they have uh, recommended the use of uh, pet uh, CT surveillance. The previously there uh, there was the concept of doing a uh, 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 upfront neck dissection in a patient who and uh, who is having large volume disease and. Uh, there was a concept of doing a uh, upfront uh, salvage neck dissection after uh, CTRT in mm-hmm. oropharyngeal in, in uh, head and neck cases, oropharyngeal or hepharyngeal primary. So after the, in that Mahana et al suggested that uh, the uh, head CT when it it is done on uh, on follow up and then at the 10, 10 to twelve week after the CTRT. Uh, we can follow up with the PET scan and it it, it, it is have equal, uh, equivalent survival uh, advantage with the uh, surveillance of uh, with PET scan. We have a very very good sensitivity of uh, around ninety uh, percent. So the number of planned neck dissections have come down with the surveillance. Yes, sir. actually the cost of the treatment has also come down. Yes, uh, come down. So suppose after the PET neck, PET, you, if you uh, have an equivocal response on the PET, then whether you wanted to do the neck dissection or you just wanted to keep the patient on the observation again. Also, as a sort of a surveillance on the pet, the pet uh, if pet is uh, sh- showing a uh, uptake uh, there, uh, then we uh, we should go ahead with the salvage neck dissection sir. no if you have a positive a yes response. then if it yes, is an equivocal response then how do you want it to proceed in, in this case if, suppose if the patient is having an equivocal response and you have asked for an fna they said non viable cells then whether you wanted to observe the patient or you wanted to go ahead and do the surgery yes, sir uh, i'm not sure about that and timing will be a factor for that, sir. If it is a equivocal response at 10 or 12 weeks, first scan we have done, and it is a equivocal response on 10 and 10 to 12 weeks on the first scan, then we can observe it. And if it is a equivocal response on later on scans on follow up, then I think we can do a next discussion. <laughs> so how often you do pets uh, follow up all during all follow up or is it uh, certain specific you know you know for us it is maybe difficult yes sir in uh, like in uh, indian uh, our settings in, uh, in indian scenario uh, because the pet is a costly uh, investigation uh, so we often not do a uh, pet scan for uh, uh, the routine uh, follow up of the patients. If, if we have any kin- clinical suspicion uh, or uh, a palpable uh, uh, patient is having any complaint of uh, uh, having any symptoms and uh, or we have any clinical suspicion of uh, any recurrence or uh, a residual note, then we can we go ahead and do that. But uh, guidelines- suppose, uh, suppose you have a pet that is not available, a place you are working, it's difficult to get a pet scan for. This thing, then uh, what will we do? Salvage what type of neck dissection or salvage neck dissection or anything else? Sir, uh, if there is only localized, a small, uh, doubtful lesion, but FNAC is equivocal, but PET scan is not available for follow. So you cannot use that out study. You know, so we can do what will be the next, uh, best, uh, next best approach? You can use it. Sir, if we doesn't want to, uh, if we are not doing, uh, want to do a salvage neck dissection, complete salvage neck dissection, uh, we can do a super selective neck dissection uh, in these scenarios. There are uh, some evidences that suggest that uh, super selective neck dissection, like uh, uh, clearing the one or two uh, lymph node levels uh, in the uh, uh, nodal area that is uh, showing uh, there is a presence of any uh, node, uh, that, uh, clearing that uh, all the fiber fatty tissue and nodes in that uh, uh, one or uh, two levels uh, in that area will be uh, having a similar uh, control rates uh, with the in the super selective night dissection in, the, in these kind of patients. There's a paper by uh, Robbins. Uh, something 2007 they have published this uh, they have done a 54 uh, 
neck uh, super selective neck dissections and then in that uh, round only uh, i think six or seven patients having uh, had uh, the uh, in the, they have done a neck dissection in the, in the only six and seven patient had uh, uh, positive lymph nodes in uh, other areas than uh, the no, uh, that positive area so we can uh, that uh, with that data we can think of doing a super treatment yeah, sometimes we must be careful also no? see like for example in this particular scenario so it's a large node so again all the you mentioned about this kt robbins paper and also uh, although theoretically uh, people talk about it and i know also few centers do about it but i think yeah. uh, we have to be uh, very very careful uh, i think because it's super selective so right. you have to be very super selective of your patients also when you sort of you know do it otherwise in such a case like you know where there's an 8.5 cm node you know, so we'll have right. to sort of you know, be very careful in there is no uh, strong evidences to suggest the use of super selective neck dissection so most of the neck like, nodes in the west you no know, they'll be very small a centimeter or two and all those for third they, you can sort of you know maybe we may have to get more data from our side i yes. guess yes. on this, uh, but yes this is a uh, this is a reasonably acceptable uh, way to go about in uh, very highly selective. so jitendra in surveillance if you are looking uh, there is something called as myriads classification you can you tell us something about that yes sir uh, sorry can... myriad surveillance in the imaging so you are aware about this myriad Yes, sir. Nairad's uh, class. Actually, I don't remember it completely. Um, Nairad classification is used for post uh, in the post-operative and or post-treatment surveillance of the yeah. patient. And, uh, and uh, I think Nairad's. Uh, I, I don't remember actually, sir. Complete yeah, classification. I don't remember. look into it. Yeah. Nairad three is the Nairad three is the suspicious. I and uh, highly suspicious. Two. So you have total yeah. four. Nairad's one, two, three, and four. Yes, and in two you have two a to b so so a highly suspicion is three and I definitely proven is four definitely is four so in between two a and two b the pet comes into play when you have a two b kind of a lesion so when you have a suspicious kind of thing then in a two b lesion you'll uh, go ahead and do the pet scan yes and in a nirad 3 if the imaging is suggest you of it then you have to go and do a biopsy biopsy um, i think um... we can put an end to the session if uh, the panelists agree to our commerce um, yes sir um, i think we had a great session uh, before uh, uh, completing it i would like the panel the faculty members to um, uh, rate uh, dr jitendra about his performance now uh, dr sudeep sir uh, i think uh, i will listen to uh, arvind and uh, yeah uh, dr arvind sir no uh, no i, I I think he did uh, well. He did very well. I think uh, he presented it well, and uh, most of the questions he was able to sort of you know, <laughs> answer. And uh, I think wish him uh, good luck. I think you know, because uh, I guess you know the, the different set of examiners may throw in different uh, uh, questions and also you just uh, try to sort of you know gauge their mood. At the end of the day, of course, uh, uh, it's about uh, sort of you know uh, rationalizing whatever you have said, like you know. so i guess uh, at least in uh, uh, the topic like carcinoma of unknown primary of course we have not gone into the total depths of treatments uh, here and there but uh, with uh, lack of uh, randomized control trials to guide treatment decisions and multiple options there uh, i guess no every person will be right in a way whatever they say and whatever they do in such scenarios you will have to be a little bit of extra cautious and try to toe the examiner's line so it's about uh, intelligently sort of you know towing the examiner's line Uh, with the existing knowledge and uh, i think he presented well and best wishes and again thank you for uh, having me and sharing my limited time on this week kranti kranti what is his, what is your opinion yes sir he was fine sir what as sir said uh, arvin sir said uh, basically he needs to justify if he is saying surgery he needs to justify surgery if he is saying radiation or the chemo radiation he has to have his answers for justification <laughs> so he was fine sir absolutely fine fantastic sir Hey, Jitendra is good, but uh, I will say that you know we need uh, you know the nirads and other things. We routinely our yes. radiologist report nowadays. Now we have the yes, sir, we have, uh, 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 so they report routinely. The so I think you are really. I hope your monthly you are seeing are at least two hundred, three hundred 
histopathology record so you should remember all those things you know in the present time so we um, so i that I, is the most important thing is whatever you are doing routinely you should not miss anything so those things and acquire as far as as much knowledge as possible but yeah. base is should be what you are doing you know in the clinics so that should be strong enough so that you know you should not miss anything otherwise the immediately the examiners feel that you know he is not reading the pathology report properly you know some unnecessary information uh, they feel so don't allow the investigate uh, the examiners to you know guess those and uh, and uh, those things okay that is what my opinion but uh, you did a very good Job. I I if I may add sir, yeah, right, sorry, I sir. agree with every everyone but uh, I think uh, Jitendra a few I mean of course just confined to the uh, unknown primary looks okay but like if we take you in any direction I mean couple of occasions you got I mean uh, a few more answers we expect when we talk about HPV we talk about the viability we talk about narrates so I think uh, a little more uh, you should uh, try to read in those directions uh, as far as unknown primary just specific to the topic i agree with everyone it was okay and just rationalize your thought process that's all yes thank you. yes ma'am i'll read more uh, so we conclude uh, with the final remarks of all the panelists we conclude the session thank you so much sudeep sir thank you so much arvin sir thank you so much richa ma'am thank you so much uh, kranti sir for taking out your valuable time in the evening and thank you jitendra for a wonderful presentation hope uh, to see you all again the panelists uh, after 15 days thank you so much thank you thank you thank so you much thank you thank you so much